Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's virtual media briefing about COVID-19 in London and Middlesex County. We're glad to have you along with us. Also happy to be joined this afternoon by the Mayor of London, Ed Holder, the Acting Medical Officer of Health at the Middlesex London Health Unit, and Carol Young Ritchie, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Nursing Executive at London Health Sciences Centre. We're also happy to have you along, members of the media. And a reminder, if you have not joined us before for one of our briefings, or if it's your first time in a while, if you have a question for any of the folks on the call this afternoon, just click on the question mark in the text bubble here on Microsoft Teams, indicating your name, your media outlet, and who your question is for. And finally, to those joining us this afternoon on uh, Rogers Television, as well as the Rogers Facebook page and YouTube channel, or the CTV London website, a welcome to you as well. Let's get to our opening remarks and we'll start this afternoon with Mayor Ed Holder. Mayor Holder. Well, thanks, Dan, and good afternoon, everyone. No matter where you look right now, pressure's mounting. We see it in hospitals where doctors and nurses and healthcare workers continue to deal with increasingly higher patient volumes. Since Friday, the number of inpatients at LHSC has climbed from 78 to 89, while the number of critical care ICU uh, admissions, well, it's nearly doubled. Uh, since uh, from 12 to 21. But not only are they dealing with increased patient volume, they have less staff on hand thanks to rising COVID infections, which are up another 25% since late last week. Similar pressures are being felt by countless numbers of businesses across our region, either locked down entirely or having to manage at severely reduced capacity. I said before, and I'll continue saying, please, if there was ever a time to support local business, this is it. Order takeout, buy a gift card, do curbside pickup. No matter how you do it, keep your dollars local. It means so much and it's truly needed more than ever. In addition to pressures at our hospitals and small businesses, there's pressure at home as tens of thousands of families continue the delicate and extremely stressful balancing act of online learning while uh, continuing with their professional responsibilities. It is extremely taxing mentally, emotionally, even financially. So it's my hope that kids across London, Middlesex and throughout the province are able to resume in-class learning by Monday of next week as originally scheduled, assuming the science shows there's no greater risk than they, uh, than, uh, than they would otherwise be in. That's not only vital to their academic and social development, I know it's equally important for their parents. Like so much right now, it really is a case of wait and see, but please don't wait on getting vaccinated, especially third doses. In addition to mass vaccination clinics, which now includes Nichols Arena, there are numerous mobile clinics, and you can find a list at healthunit.com. We all know vaccines and especially boosters dramatically reduce your risk of severe illness and is almost in all cases, uh, keeping you from taking up a bed in a hospital. With so much out of our control right now, this is one of the few things we do have control over and one of the best ways to help hospitals, businesses, and families, so please. Let's continue getting shots and arms as fast as possible. So that's it for me. I'll turn it now over to Dr. Summers. Thank you, Mayor Holder, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as the mayor referenced, uh, pressure is indeed building in all aspects of our COVID-19 response. Uh, the Omicron wave continues. Uh, each day this past weekend, we reported over 400 cases. As you know, that is a significant underrepresentation of the total number of cases in our community and an underrepresentation of the burden of infection that we're experiencing right now. Hospitalizations have increased and we'll hear from Carol Young Ritchie at London Health Sciences Centre about that in a moment. Sadly, we also reported four new deaths over this past weekend, uh, including amongst fully vaccinated individuals. As you will hear from Carol Young Ritchie at London Health Sciences Centre, we are shifting to, to um, hearing about whether or not cases are hospitalized with COVID-19 or from COVID-19. It is a challenge at times though to distinguish between those two. Uh, the reality is that being infected with COVID-19 may cause mild symptoms, but if you have other medical challenges, it may be enough to put you in hospital and so it can be challenging to distinguish between that. What remains the same, though, is that our goal right now is to slow the spread of COVID-19 and Omicron as much as possible so that we minimize the stress on our healthcare system. 
it is going to be challenging for us to stop the transmission of Omicron through our region. However, we can do a lot to slow it and ensure by the time uh, we start to reopen aspects of our society that we have excellent booster coverage amongst a majority of our population and that our health system is in a position to deal with the cases that do occur. Please continue to minimize your close contacts as much as possible. Gather only indoors uh, for non-essential purposes with those with whom you live or with a small circle and keep that circle consistent. The more we minimize our indoor uh, activities, the more we are able to slow the transmission of this virus. Make sure you are masking at all times when you're in an indoor environment, uh, particularly in the public and the general public, or if you have to go into work. If you're an employer, make sure that you have as many of your employees as possible working remotely. And for those that are working in person, make sure masking is uh, enforced and in place. These steps are critical. They work and they're essential in slowing the transmission of COVID-19. Vaccination and particularly the booster dose right now also remains a key tool in our toolbox as we plan for a February that hopefully has less transmission than what we are seeing now. Thanks to everyone who continues to book your booster dose, find the pharmacy with a spot, come to our mass vaccination clinics. It's tremendous to see. Tomorrow we will be reporting our updated vaccination coverage and I will invite you to look at those booster coverage once it's available. I anticipate it to be quite a jump from last week. We have increasing opportunities for vaccination across the region. The Earl Nichols mass vaccination site opened up last week and is now operating again this week. We will continue to be adding appointments there as we get our feet under us. But as it stands, uh, if you are having difficulty booking an appointment, make sure you check out Earl Nichols. There are 7,000 appointments available at Earl Nichols between now and February 2nd. Um, so there are appointments available. Um, we know that sometimes folks go to the Agriplex and maybe don't find an appointment at the Agriplex and then don't go and check what's available at Earl Nichols. So make sure you visit the Earl Nichols site. There are appointments available there. We are going to continue to add appointments even in the short term as we uh, ensure and stabilize our staffing levels. The Govax bus came this past weekend, which was great to see, visited the Pond Mills uh, neighborhood and over 180 people uh, received a vaccine. The MLHU mobile team uh, will be expanding its operations starting next week and um, our partners at Middlesex London Paramedic Service uh, are out and about and vaccinating in the county. So we'll make sure that both the city and the county are covered in the mobile efforts that we as a system are ensuring are rolling out and we'll provide more updates on those dates when available. I want to highlight as well that following the announcement from the province last week, the Middlesex London Health Unit uh, in partnership with London Health Sciences and with our primary care partners will be accelerating vaccination appointment access for educators and child care staff. Um, later on today, information will be disseminated out uh, through school boards to educators and through child care centers uh, with information on how to book appointments at the mass vaccination clinics and at London Health Science Center clinics, as well as some information about primary care pop-up clinics that will be happening over the next week. Uh, 3,500 appointments will be added initially to that. In addition, of course, to the 7,000 appointments available at Earl Nichols to the general public over the next little while, and we'll be continuing to add appointments as much as we can. Schools remain out. And as I've mentioned, it's an absolute priority for our community to get schools back in session. It is the essential work of children to be in school and through masking, through vaccination and through minimizing our in-person activities outside of the classroom and outside of our workplaces, we can reduce the risk in schools as much as possible. I hope that we can get kids back to school as soon as we can and all of these efforts make a big difference. Thanks as always for joining us this afternoon. And with that, I'll pass things over to Carol Young Ritchie from London Health Sciences Center. Thanks, Dr. Summers, and good afternoon. And thanks once again for having me here to share the update on the COVID-19 situation at London Health Sciences. As of this morning, we are caring for 89 COVID positive inpatients with 21 of those patients being in critical care. 
In our children's hospital, we have five or fewer patients with COVID-19 and fewer than five in our pediatric critical care. At this time, we have received five or fewer patients from hospitals throughout the province and continue to be available to provide further support as directed by the Ontario Critical Care COVID Command Centre. Currently, we have two units which continue to be on outbreak. Clinical Neurosciences at University Hospital has 12 confirmed patient cases associated with the outbreak and five or fewer confirmed staff positives, with 20 staff positive which are potentially linked to it. Our adult psychiatric intensive care unit at Victoria Hospital has five or fewer confirmed patient cases associated with the outbreak and five or fewer confirmed cases with potential nine staff cases. The majority of cases associated with both outbreaks are still being investigated, so we may see those numbers change as we are able to definitely de determine their origin. We continue to take all measures possible to continue to resolve the outbreaks as quickly as possible. As of this morning, 434 staff are off after testing positive for COVID-19. We continue to work with our teams at Occupational Health and Safety and Human Resources in order to get those employees back to work when it's safe to do so. Due to the province enacting Directive 2, we are performing fewer surgeries and procedures, which enables us to redeploy and reassign staff to help in areas that may be short due to illness. We'd like to remind the public that our doors are open and we continue to care for patients despite some of these challenges. Finally, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our staff and physicians and say thank you. I recognize that so for many of, for many of your colleagues are away due to illness and rising cases in the community, this can be a stressful time. We truly appreciate your dedication to our patient care and, your, and that you continue to show during these challenging pandemic times. Thank you. And thank you, Carol Young Ritchie, Dr. Alex Summers, and Mayor Ed Holder. Uh, let's get to the questions. We do have a lot of them already this afternoon. And we'll start with some questions from Jennifer Beeman at the London Free Press. Uh, Carol Young Ritchie, these are for you. Um, and you mentioned, uh, Dr. Summers mentioned the, the distinction hospitalizations with COVID for or due to COVID. Um, the question from Jennifer Beeman, Carol, is, with LHSC now reporting hospitalizations with COVID from uh, those that were for or due to COVID, is this a meaningful distinction? Yes, it is. And what we're doing, again, safety is really important to us at LHSC. So we are swabbing all patients who come into the hospital for admission for COVID. So what we're finding is some patients have come to hospital with COVID symptoms and are street treating care for their COVID symptoms. They're coming to hospital to be treated for COVID. We also have patients who are coming to hospital for other reasons, like for example, they've been in a car accident and we treat and we swab them and they're being, uh, they're found to be COVID positive. So we, there is a distinction towards the patients who are coming to get care and that's co admitted for COVID and admitted with COVID. And we're collecting that, that information uh, and certainly uh, it's being collected through all hospitals now. Thank you very much. Let's go to our next question. It's a follow-up for you. Um, Jennifer Beeman from the Free Press asked Carol, uh, how are the COVID-19 patients LHSC is seeing now different from the ones they saw in other waves? Are the cases less acute? Are they vaccinated but with comorbidities, shorter hospital stays, those kinds of questions? Yeah, thanks for that question, Jennifer. And I'll just say that as this Omicron variant has come upon us rather quickly, uh, we're still analyzing a lot of that data and certainly trying to get a hold of that. What we are seeing, uh, I would say at an early stage, and again, this might change, is that we have uh, currently less patients in our ICU and a lot of patients on our medicine units. We are seeing uh, a little bit less uh, or less length of stay than some of the patients that we've seen in the past with the Delta variant. Uh, but again, uh, these are early days and we're early part of managing this uh, Omicron variant. And Dr. Summers, a follow up to you. Just building on Carol's comments, uh, what is being seen across the province is that uh, the largest proportion of intensive care patient, intensive unit, uh, intensive care unit patients with COVID-19 are unvaccinated individuals and the uh, rate and the, the ratio of hospitalization to ICU is changing. Um, certainly, um, especially amongst people that are vaccinated, the severity of illness proportionally is less. However, the numbers are so big, and this is where we have to remember that a small percentage of a large number is still a large number, particularly when you're talking about 
finite resources like intensive care unit beds. And when we say beds, it's not just a bed, it's staff, trained staff. That's the critical thing when we talk about ICU beds. And so it is all the more important that we as a community rally to keep our distance so we can support our healthcare teams as they care for us. Um, and they are really putting out that extra effort. Thanks, Carol Young, to you and your team uh, for everything. Thank you very much, Dr. Summers. Let's go back to the questions. And there's another one for Carol Young Ritchie, and I'm just bringing it up on the screen here. And uh, Jennifer's question, LHSC is reporting 434 COVID cases among staff, and you mentioned that in your opening remarks. Uh, Jennifer would like to know how many staff are isolating at home after an exposure, and do we know how many exposed staff are on a test to stay protocol? Yes, so thank you for that. So we have 434 staff who are off, who actually have COVID and they're off of work. We, I don't have the exact numbers of the staff who are off isolating. Again, we're tracking all these cases and it really, um, it really is a matter of who has been, uh, if they have a household contact or they don't have a household contact and how we bring them back. I will say, Jennifer, first and foremost, what we're really, really focusing on is trying to reduce the number of outbreaks in the organization. So being very careful when we bring staff back and really taking each case individually and doing the testing as they come back. And I'm sorry, I don't have the exact numbers for you today. All right, uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, let's go to the next question. And once again, this one is for you and it's a follow up from Jennifer Beeman. Um, Carol Young Ritchie McMaster has a monoclonal antibodies clinic for high risk COVID-19 patients. Does LHSC have these therapeutics available to COVID-19 patients too? And what treatments does LHSC have available? Yeah. Um, thank you for that. We did stand up, I would say, geez, about eight, a year ago, eight months ago, we did stand up a special clinic for patients who have had COVID to make sure they're managed on an outpatient basis with some of the symptoms that we've, um, we've certainly heard about like long haul. So we do have a, a COVID clinic for those patients. Uh, the availability of monoclonal antibodies and drugs like that uh, are in short supply. I don't have the exact answer for you that, but I can get one of our communications folks to follow up with you on that. Thank you very much. Let's go to our next question. Uh, Dr. Summers, this one is for you and it comes to us from Jane Sims at the London Free Press. Uh, Dr. Summers, three of the four deaths reported over the weekend were people associated with long-term care, all of whom were vaccinated and boosted. Are you concerned that third dose boosters aren't holding back the virus? And do you think the schedule for fourth shots for long-term care residents needs to start sooner? Uh, thanks for that question, Jane. Um, I, the third dose boosters are absolutely reducing the number of people who would be ending up in hospital relative to what our reality would be if we did not have those boosters. However, there are going to be instances where individuals who have been boosted will end up in hospital because of frankly the amount of cases we are seeing given the transmission of Omicron. And so I fully anticipate we will see hospitalizations amongst individuals who have been boosted. I fully anticipated and I'm not surprised, although very saddened uh, to see uh, deaths amongst those that have been boosted. Again, I think again it highlights um, the fact that Omicron is so transmissible and so infectious that we are seeing so many cases and therefore the less likely events are still going to happen. I want to highlight though again that the booster dose remains the most fundamental thing we can do for those particularly over the ages of 50 to limit the risks of ending up in hospital for that individual and to limit the strain on the healthcare system. The uh, rollout of the fourth dose, or essentially a, an additional booster to long-term care and retirement home residents is proceeding with gusto. Um, our long-term care home facilities uh, are able to deliver the vaccine themselves. And we know that the ordering of that vaccine from the health unit is happening as we speak. And we will see quite a few fourth doses roll out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that There is an urgency to that, certainly. Uh, but truly the, the most important part that we can do right now is decrease transmission risk in the general community so as to protect those facilities to the best of our ability. Thank you very much, Dr. Summers. And let's go to the next question. It is from Jacqueline LaBelle at Global News Radio 980 CFPL. Carol Young Ritchie, this one is for you. Uh, when LHSC reports the number of inpatients in its care with COVID-19, for example, 89 today, 
Does that figure include any cases among children or are those numbers separate? No, that includes children and we report children as anyone who's under 18. And for privacy reasons, we report that uh, to you as uh, five or less. But they are included in their overall number, yes. Thank you very much. Let's go to a follow up from Jacqueline LaBelle. This one is for Dr. Summers. Uh, Dr. Summers, looking at long term care and retirement homes in the Middlesex, London region, is the MLHU aware of any staffing concerns with the surge of Omicron cases? If so, is the health unit working with homes to ensure patient care is not affected? Uh, thanks for that question, Jacqueline. Yes, uh, some facilities in our community um, are experiencing staffing pressures as a result of uh, staff who are either exposed um, to COVID-19 or who are themselves diagnosed with COVID-19. So we are aware. Um, the process that's put in place for those facilities includes a very similar process to what uh, London Health Sciences Centre, for example, is using, which is a, a test to work process that can bring people who are exposed but asymptomatic and vaccinated uh, back to work early. Again, it's a uh, balance between the risk of uh, providing care and the risk of somebody who is exposed coming to the workplace. There are steps that we can take to minimize the risk of outbreak and transmission, just like the hospital is doing. That same process is in place for long-term care home facilities. Uh, we are, because of the pressure uh, in our community right now, having to make those challenging decisions of balancing the need for services and care to be provided to those that need it and the risk of transmission. Uh, so we do support uh, the facilities through that. The province is experiencing this across the board. Um, we hear identical reports uh, from Windsor to Ottawa on this, and the province is releasing ongoing and updated guidance on how to balance this and what protocols need to be taken to ensure uh, that staffing in these very essential and vulnerable areas can be maintained. Thank you very much, Dr. Summers. Let's go to a quick follow up from Jacqueline Lavelle for you. Uh, Dr. Summers, when is the Omicron wave expected to peak locally? Uh, thanks, Jacqueline. I won't be able to commit on that. What we've seen in other jurisdictions, uh, specifically other countries, is that the Omicron wave has about an eight to 12 week shelf life, if not slightly shorter. And that's because of the rate of transmission now. Obviously, we are actually at trying to lengthen out the wave um, so that we can minimize the impact on the on the healthcare system. Uh, we saw our wave start here at the beginning of December, so we are kind of into week six of our Omicron wave. The last four weeks, in particular, seeing the rapid rise in cases. Um, January is going to continue to be a challenging month. I think there is hope and optimism that February. Uh, regardless really of how the next few weeks going will be better than now. Um, but we have to again be prepared for the uh, really short term efforts we have to do right now to try and minimize the height of this wave and try and slow that transmission. Uh, but again, we won't know exactly uh, when things will start to trend down until they do. Thank you very much. Let's go to another question from Jacqueline LaBelle for you, Dr. Summers. And this does sort of touch on something we've talked about already during the briefing, but I think it's uh, a little more specific that Jacqueline is looking for. So uh, Dr. Summers with LHSC now categorizing patients as being hospitalized with COVID-19 versus being hospitalized for COVID-19. How might this impact MLHU's assessment of local data? Are there new insights that you've been able to gain already? Um, thanks for that question, Jacqueline. When we as a health unit track hospitalizations of Middlesex and London residents, um, we do rely on our health hospital partners to provide us that clinical information of why that person is in hospital. Um, and then we take that information and categorize it as per uh, the standards that the province outlines for us. And those standards um, kind of have definitions around what's considered a COVID-19 hospitalization. So as we start to get some of this nuanced information from our hospital system partners, uh, we will be able to uh, hopefully have a better sense of what is a COVID-19 hospitalization. What we're interested in, of course, is, is truly people that are in hospital for COVID-19. 
with so much COVID-19 in our community, there will be some folks that are in hospital for other reasons that happen to test positive for COVID-19. And we do want to distinguish that as much as possible. But as I highlighted before, that's not always, and actually very rarely, a black and white distinction. Um, it can be hard to figure out exactly why someone's in hospital, as our partners at the hospital will attest to, especially when you're talking about chronic illnesses that are worsened by transient viral infections um, or transient viral infections that can be kind of severe, like COVID-19. So we will watch that information as it comes in and try to understand exactly how it impacts our local picture. I would say right now, you know, what we do know is that it is likely that not all cases that are classified as COVID-19 in hospital have would have um, been prevented if they didn't have COVID-19. Some of those folks are going to be in there anyways. But what is clear, and this is where we just need to talk honestly about what reality we're dealing with, is that there's been a massive surge in hospitalizations and ICU admissions over the last three to four weeks, and that COVID-19 is driving them. We can talk about what's happening at the margins around those numbers, but the reality isn't any different. Hospitals are under strain because of COVID-19. That conclusion is unchanged to me and unchanged to the hospitals and unchanged to many. It's the same conclusions. And so I don't want us to lose the forest for the trees when we're talking about for versus with COVID-19 because the strain on the hospital system is real no matter how we categorize that. And it's being driven by COVID-19 transmission in our community. Thank you for that uh, very comprehensive and thorough answer, uh, Dr. Summers. And and yeah, it really does add a lot of context to the situation, even though we're talking about some pretty small words. Big distinction there. Uh, let's go to the next question. Jane Sims from the London Free Press. Dr. Summers, what do you say to people who are thinking that getting infected with Omicron is inevitable and are deciding not to bother with booster shots? Can you discuss the value of booster shots when there is so many breakthrough infections? Thanks so much, Jane, for that question. Um, there's been a lot of conversation and uh, wondering about the inevitability of COVID and what does that mean when we say inevitable? I wanna really differentiate between the difference about being exposed to COVID-19 and then what subsequently happens to you when you are exposed. Over the course of our collective lifetimes, we are likely to be exposed to COVID-19 because of the infectiousness, it's now high prevalence in our community, we are likely to be exposed to COVID-19 at some point. That may be inevitable. What happens when you're exposed, however, is very much influenced by a number of things and most notably your vaccination status. And that truly is where the benefit of a booster shot as is the benefit of a first and second dose, um, carries its significant weight. It is not inevitable that you need to be exposed to COVID-19 without the substantial added protection of the vaccine. That is not inevitable. And when you have two doses of vaccine, you reduce your risk of hospitalization and severe illness. And when you have a booster dose and are up to date with your COVID-19 vaccinations, you profoundly reduce your risk of severe illness and hospitalization. And that truly is the outcome that we are trying to avoid. So again, I think the term inevitable is an important thing to talk about. We've certainly heard lots of conversation about this, and I want to differentiate between what it means to be exposed and what it means once you've been exposed. And the booster dose and the vaccine make all the difference in the world when it comes to what can happen if you are exposed, particularly if you are older in age. Let's move to our next question from Jacqueline LaBelle at Global News Radio 980 CFPL. Dr. Summers, this one is for you. Uh, you mentioned new initiatives to provide prioritize third doses among staff in childcare and elementary and secondary schools. Can you provide more details about these initiatives and how long it will take to vaccinate this cohort? Uh, thanks for that question, Jacqueline. Uh, what we are doing in the short term is uh, taking any unused appointments and making them available uh, first come first serve uh, to childcare, elementary and secondary staff. Every, uh, those appointments come through a variety of different ways. Um, we have set aside appointments for children 
Um, some of those child appointments are not used uh, because the demand is not as brisk for those appointments as if they are for the booster doses. So every day we open up the child appointments three days from now to the general public. Moving forward, we're going to open up those appointments to childcare, elementary and secondary uh, employees. The other thing that we're going to add on is the additional appointments that we're able to add at Agriplex um, and Earl Nichols from the stabilization of our staffing in the short term. Um, as you know, over the course of January, as we've been able to stabilize our staffing numbers, we're able to add on additional appointments often in the next week. Those appointments have been open up to the general public for the sh next short while. We will open up those appointments as they become available to uh, child care, elementary and secondary staff. So that's how we're making those appointments available. Additionally, our partners at London Health Sciences Centre have occupational health clinics that they've been using to vaccinate their staff and they have some additional capacity there that we are going to open up thanks to their partnership uh, to educators and staff. And then lastly, some of our primary care partners are going to have their own pop up walk in clinics available at some of their family medicine or primary care clinics. So that's the strategy here. Um, the mechanism that these people are going to access those appointments very slightly on our website at covidvaccinelm.ca. There will be a uh, special gate called targeted populations that's specifically available to this group. And when you book an appointment through that time, through that slot, you'll have to bring proof of employment to your appointment in order to validate that you actually qualify to uh, book into that accelerated appointment slot. In terms of the time it's going to take to vaccinate this cohort, not entirely clear. A number of people in that cohort have already received a booster because we've been vaccinating a lot over the last three to four weeks. We also know that not everybody in that cohort is going to get vaccinated. It is not mandatory vaccination at this time for a booster dose or for first and or second doses. So uh, the amount of time uh, still will depend on the amount of demand. Um, as I mentioned, you know, even at a population level, we've got 7,000 spots available in the next number of weeks at Earl Nichols. We're adding on additional appointments. I think through pharmacies, mass facts, our partners at London Health Sciences and primary care, um, we are going to make major steps in vaccinating that group uh, over the next three to four weeks. Thank you very much, Dr. Summers. And one last question, and this one is for Carol Young Ritchie. It's from Jennifer Beeman at the London Free Press. Uh, during the UH outbreaks and second wave in late 2020, LHSC really limited moving staff between hospital sites and units. Is this policy still in place? Has it been adapted due to the Omicron strain on health human resources? Thank you for that. And I'll say we learned something new every wave and from wave two, we learned how important it was not to move as much as possible staff between units. So with with keeping in mind, uh, we really want to uh, reduce our, our outbreaks we have in our organization. We've adopted that practice and continue to not move staff between units as best we can. I will say as we've had a number of staff off with Omicron um, that we have had to make some movements, but we do that quite carefully. We try as much as possible not to move staff between units. Thank you very much, Carol. And that does bring us to the end of our questions for this afternoon's media briefing. We thank you very much for your time. Uh, Mayor Holder, Dr. Summers, Carol, thank you so much for your insights and for your information. Lots to digest today on the media briefing. And we expect there will be, well, information that is useful and enlightening and, and, uh, and, and the latest on COVID-19 when we come back with our next virtual media briefing on Thursday afternoon. We hope you'll join us Thursday at 2 p.m. So between now and then, have a great rest of your Monday. Have a good start to the week. We'll see you on Thursday and so long for now.